Hello everybody, Plato here bringing you the final update to our mage build, focusing on the late late game for your new game plus 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 plus. This build is going to be focusing on level 200 and forward, and I do recommend around the 222 level mark so we can allocate our points a little bit more efficiently. Now I do apologize for this video being late, I had a hectic work week followed by my beautiful cat splitting his dewclaw, so that was a whole ordeal. He's doing a lot better now. However, he is not very satisfied that he has to have a cone around his neck. But I digress. And as always, guys, everything that you need for this build and how to obtain it will be linked in the description down below. So please, before you comment, Plato, where the heck do I find all of these? Click and expand that description link. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, one thing I do want to say about this build is I don't want this to be a build that people copy one for one because you can add your own flair and your own play style and there's going to be a lot of variety as you'll see when we move forward. Now, I do recommend that you do be level 222 at least, especially for our points distribution for our attributes, as that's going to be the bare minimum amount we'll need for this build to truly shine. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the staff we're going to be using, which is going to be the Prince of Death staff, and it is maxed out at plus 25. So as you can see with the Prince of Death staff, we have a sorcery scaling of 430. Pop quiz, why do we have a sorcery scaling of 430? If you want to find out more, link in the description down below to my sorcery scaling video, as well as my soft cap video and my seal scaling video as well. But if you didn't watch the video and you want a quick refresher, the reason we have such a high sorcery scaling of 430 matching the Lusat staff at 99 is the fact that we have points invested into intelligence and faith, 80 on both to be exact. And that is very key as I feel like this is the point where this staff starts just being the best staff in the game because again, it matches the Lusat sorcery scaling of 430 and you don't have to worry about your spells costing an extra additional 50% FP. If you want to go ahead and dump 99 points into intelligence and 99 points into faith a little bit later on, this staff will have the highest sorcery scaling at 448. If you take a look at the passive bonus for the Prince of Death staff, it goes ahead and boosts Death Sorcery as well at about 15% from the testing that I've done. Now it is a shame that most of the death spells are pretty underwhelming and really not balanced well compared to the other spells. Hopefully they get a buff soon, but there is going to be one we're going to be using and we'll get to that a little bit later. While we're still on the topic of staffs, did you know that you can also dual wield staffs to get the passive bonus from another staff for a spell that you do want to use? Let's go and take a look at some examples. Now for our first example, we are using the Karen Regal Scepter, which provides damage bonuses to the full moon spells. As you can see, with it equipped for our offhand as a passive bonus, we did about 2200 damage with Wani's Dark Moon. When we unequip the Karen Regal Scepter, we go ahead and do about 2000 damage. So. If you do have some spells that you do want to use that utilizes another staff, you can go ahead and use that on your offhand instead of, let's say, a shield or a weapon and take advantage of that passive damage bonus. For a second example, you can see with the meteorite staff equipped on our offhand, we did about 1700 damage to the bird. And you're going to see here when we take off the meteorite staff and just use rock sling without the passive bonus that it gives us, we'll do about like 1350 damage to the bird. Please note that the offhand that you use does not have to be fully leveled to take advantage of the passive bonus. Now do keep in mind that you are not just limited to the Karen Regal Scepter or the Meteorite Staff as there are other staffs in the game that provides passive bonus to other spells. More information on that can be found on my Sorcery Scaling video, links down below. Moving on from our staff, let's go ahead and take a look at a new addition to this build in the form of the Golden Order Seal. Now, while there are other seals you can use, the reason we are using the Golden Order seal is just like the Prince of Death staff, it scales with intelligence and faith. And since we have 80 points into intelligence and faith, you can see that it has a massive incantation scaling of 370, and it's not even maxed out at plus 10 at the moment. Well, now you're probably wondering, well, Plato, why are we even using a seal in the first place if you're only going to be using it for one incantation, which is Golden Vow? Well, we're not going to only be using it for one incantation. This is just the current spell setup that I have. And if you want to just use it for Golden Vow, I highly recommend because the incantation version of the Golden Vow versus the Ash of War lasts double the time from 45 seconds to 80 seconds. And it provides you with a 15% damage boost as well as a 10% damage reduction boost as well, which is going to be extremely helpful because we are running the Magic Scorpion Talisman, which we'll get to in just a moment. Now the beauty of being this far ahead in levels means we can go ahead and equip our staff and seal at the same time and go ahead and cycle between our sorceries and our incantations, really giving us a huge variety in our gameplay. As you can see here though, not all incantations are created equal. I really love this Scarlet incantation, but my fucking god, man, why is it? 
Why is it so bad? And why does it cost three slots? Anyways, I digress. In the example, you saw that I was wielding my staff in one hand and my seal in the other. Another option you can go ahead and do is wield your staff and your seal on the same hand as you can see from my inventory here, which goes ahead and frees up your other hand for a weapon or a shield if you prefer to go that route. Again, this is all going to be preference to your playstyle, so do what's best for you. Now that we've gone ahead and covered staffs and seals, let's go ahead and focus on our weapons and or shields that we can use for this build. Now the first weapon I'm going to go ahead and introduce you guys to is going to be extremely familiar and that is going to be a dagger with the Ash of War Bloodhound step. And the reason we use the dagger is because its weight is extremely low, which is perfect because we do want to stay within medium equipment load. So as you can see, Bloodhound Step is extremely satisfying to use and has the best iframes for your dodges. So if you're running into bosses that are trying to put your foolish ambitions to rest or just in any scenario, this Ashivore has got you covered. And if you take a look, now that we're out of FP, our Bloodhound Step actually gets replaced with Quick Step, which I thought was really interesting. Bloodhound Step is just too good not to have in this build. And surprise, surprise, my preference for my weapon of choice is going to be the Moonveil Katana. One of the main reasons we love the Moonveil Katana is that it scales really well with intelligence, which is great because it amplifies the weapon's base damage as well as its weapon arts. It's extremely fast when it comes to its light attacks, its heavy attacks, its jumping and running light and heavy attacks, and of course, its amazing weapon arts, the heavy slash and the light slash. Now, the Moonveil Katana did receive a nerf in patch 1.03, an undocumented nerf, by the way, to its poise damage when using its heavy weapon art. It is still S tier, and I highly recommend this. However, we do have other choices with the Wings of Estelle, as well as the Dark Moon Greatsword. The Wing of Estelle is a great alternative to the Moonveil Katana. While it doesn't have the natural range as it does for its normal light and heavy attacks, it is just as fast and makes up for that range with its weapon art. The great thing about this weapon art is that it does not cost any FP to consume as you can see here and it makes up for the lack of range as the weapon art actually has range baked right into it. While you're charging up your heavy attack you can actually press the dodge button to go ahead and do a quick dodge backwards as you can see here which is great for certain enemies. The second weapon art is going to be Nebula which does a lot of damage as well as a lot of poise damage as long as you can get close enough to the enemy and this one does cost FP. Not a fan of the Moonveil Katana or the Wings of Estelle? Well, then the Dark Moon Greatsword is going to be great for you. Not only does this weapon also scale with intelligence, but it also has Frost Buildup, which is going to be great to apply Frostbite and also receive that 10% plus the 20% extra damage from Frostbite from our Snow Witch hat. The downside is the weapon is a lot slower and requires a little bit more point investment into strength. That being said, when you do go ahead and activate its weapon art at the cost of FP, any additional slashes you go ahead and throw out as you can see here will not cost any FP and it has amazingly high poise damage so you can get those enemies staggered to the ground to go ahead and land your critical blow. If you don't want to go ahead and do dual wielding staff or using a staff and a seal or a staff and a weapon, you can go ahead and just use a staff and a shield. And a shield that I would recommend is the jellyfish shield. Now I don't have the strength requirement to wear this effectively just because I'm not specced into it as a shield player, but I will go ahead and show an example of the advantage you can have while using the jellyfish shield with its Ash of War Contagious Fury. Now do keep in mind that the Jellyfish Shield is a lot heavier, so it will push you over the edge from medium equipment load to heavy equipment load, as you can see here with our allocation of stats. To mitigate this, you can go ahead and put more points into Endurance, or you can go ahead and use different gear that is a lot less heavier than what we currently have equipped. However, with my playstyle, I'm not much of a shield user, so the 20 Endurance at this time works great for me, but as we have more levels, we'll definitely go ahead and increase our Endurance at least to 30. The great thing about the Jellyfish Shield's Ash of War is as you can see here, without it, we did 1200 damage and with it, you're going to see that we're going to do about 1500 damage, a 20% increase. The damage increase will only apply while we have the shield equipped, so don't swap away from it. Now these are just some examples of what you can do with this build. Like I said earlier in the beginning of the video, please go ahead and put your own flair to it, your own playstyle, mix and match whatever you want to do to satisfy your power fantasy in becoming the Elden Lord. Heading to our gear pieces, the only required piece of gear that I would recommend here is the Snow Witch Hat as it increases our cold sorcery, so it's going to be great for Adulo's Moonblade, Ronnie's Dark Moon, and Glinstone Ice Crag. Aside from that, you can go ahead and use anything you want for your chest piece, your gloves, and your boots as long as you stay within medium equipment load. 
I actually had the benefit of running the Black Knife armor, which provides us with better physical defenses. And that's going to be important to address when we discuss the Magic Scorpion Talisman. And the benefit of this specific armor piece is one, the drip is fucking amazing. And two, it muffles the sound of footsteps, which can be extremely helpful when sneaking up on enemies. That being said, nothing special about the gloves and boots. It's just there to stay within that medium equipment load, as well as providing the most amount of defenses that we can get. Heading to our talismans, we do have a bit change up here, starting with the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, which enormously boots our physical damage negation. Now this is your flex talisman, so please go ahead and change it to anything you like depending on your playstyle. And I'm going to go ahead and explain in just a bit why I actually prefer this talisman. Moving forward, we have the Graven Mass Talisman. This is a no-brainer, 8% damage to our sorceries. We're going to take that any time of the day. Then we have Radicon's Icon, in which my opinion is going to be the staple of any casting build, unless you are super overleveled and you can just put 70 hard points into Dexterity, which is the final soft cap for cast speed. So the way Radicon's Icon works is it provides you with a virtual 30 points into your Dexterity, but only affecting casting speed, and casting speed is going to be for your sorceries and your incantations as well. While the shortening of spell casting time doesn't affect all incantations and all spells, it does affect the majority of the ones that we are going to be daily driving, so it is a must in our build. And my recommendation is to have 20 hard points into dexterity, so when you go ahead and pop this talisman, you have a virtual of 50 dexterity, which is only 20 away from our final soft cap, and it's a nice medium. For our last talisman, we have the Magic Scorpion Charm, which raises our magic attacks but lowers our damage negation. Now, it raises our magic attack by 12%, and we're going to see here how much of the physical damage negation it's actually going to reduce. So, while we have it equipped, we have 34, 33, 36, and 35 for our physical damage negation. When we have it unequipped, we will have 40, 39, 41, and 41. So, as you can see, about an average of 5 points the Magic Scorpion dropped in our defenses. However, remember earlier how I said we love the Dragon Crest Talisman? Because this provides a great balance of the defenses that we lose from the Magic Scorpion Charm. So, with this unequipped, our defenses drop tremendously to 17, 16, 20, and 19. While this is not a big deal, equipping this just adds extra survivability because a lot of the damage we do take sometimes when we're in close range really hurts, and this is a nice buffer to have. That being said, this isn't the only solution. If you don't want to run the Dragon Crest Talisman, for example, let's just have it unequipped, and you want to have another way of boosting our defenses, well, the Incantation Golden Val is right up your alley. As you can see, with Golden Vow activated, now this is the incantation version, that last 80 seconds, you can see that our defenses went up to a respectable 25, 24, 28, and 27 without the use of the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. But if we were to use it with Golden Vow, then our defenses go to 40, 39, 42, 42. So you can go any way you want about this. If you want to use a Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, you can. If you want to use something like the Graven School Talisman to get even more glass cannon damage, you can go ahead and do that as well. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our attributes. Now I do recommend you be at least level 222 so we can fully utilize our attributes in a manner that is going to be acceptable for this build. Our main goal here is to have intelligence and faith at 80 and 80 so we have that massive sorcery scaling of 430 with the Prince of Death staff. Now we put 20 points into dexterity, so we hit that nice medium with Radicon's icon adding a 30 virtual dex for our cast speed, putting our cast speed at 50 again, which is a nice medium. We only have 12 points into strength because that's how much it requires for us to wield our moon wheel because that is our weapon of choice. Please increase your strength if you want to use weapons that require it. For Endurance, we have it at 20, which may seem a little low to a lot of people, but I have had no issues with Endurance at 20 with this specific build. It allows us to use decent gear to have great defenses and decent poise at 43 and still being in medium equipment load. Now we have our mind at 40. While this is not a soft cap per se, it does provide us with 220 FP, which is exactly the amount that a fully upgraded flask will go ahead and restore. Now we have vigor at 42, which should be 40, but I overleveled two levels, so there's an extra two points there. 40 is going to be one of the soft caps for Vigor, 60 being the final soft cap where you start seeing more of that diminishing returns, and all the information regarding soft caps and sorcery scaling and seal scaling is all going to be in the description down below, so please do check that out if you have not already. Now this is just my personal allocation of stat points because it fits my playstyle. 
Now, if you need more points in turn endurance to spam more abilities, or you just need that higher equipment load, go ahead and maybe take off five points from intelligence and faith and have intelligence at 75, faith at 75, then you can pump 30 points into endurance. Same thing applies if you need more strength, maybe take away five from intelligence and faith and apply those 10 extra points into strength so you can go ahead and wear the weapon of your choice or the shield of your choice as well. Now, if you need more points into endurance and strength, go ahead and take off 10 points from intelligence and 10 points of faith and allocate it how you want. While it is going to lower your sorcery scaling, just remember you're going to keep leveling because you're already past the point of no return. You're already taking this character past the 125 to 150 mark, which I believe people have identified as the meta for Elden Ring. So don't look back, keep on leveling, super easy to do at the palace road at New Game Plus and keep farming those mother farmers. Moving on to our spells, I don't want to spend too much time on it because there's not much to explain except for the fact that we are adding a death spell in Ancient Death Rancor, which I think has really decent utility as well as pretty decent damage. The other death spells are pretty lackluster. If you're going to use one, definitely use Ancient Death Rancor. Now, the reason I love this ability is because of its utility and the damage is an extra bonus. Every single one of those death rankers, as you can see, will stagger those enemies. So you can go ahead and follow up with additional spells pretty much for free. So you spam Ancient Death Rancor, spam a little bit of your abilities, spam it again, and you can even get close to enemies with melee range and they can't do anything because they're currently going to still be staggered by the spell. So super strong. Now for the other spells and incantations that I think are core for this build, aside from Ancient Death Rancor, is going to be Adula's Moonblade, Ronnie's Dark Moon, Glintstone Ice Crag, as well as Golden Vow. Now if you forgot about Ronnie's Dark Moon, remember that it reduces the target's magic negation by 10%. Now if this spell manages to trigger Frostbite on your target, which it usually does after just using it once, it'll then reduce the magic negation further by 20% for a total of 30% reduction. Any other spell you follow up with it will get a further 20% reduction in damage negation for a total of 30%, which is really great, right? You open up with Ronnie's Dark Moon, Frostbite is applied, switch to Death Ranker, you do more damage with it, it staggers, switch to your melee, switch to your other spells, and just delete that enemy in an instant. As far as the other spells I'm using, Carrion Slicer, Rock Sling, Loretta's Great Bow and Terra Magica, depending on my mood or if I want to switch up my playstyle, I'll add different spells and incantations here to go ahead and compensate. But at the end of the day, remember guys, this is a very versatile build, so please play to your own playstyle and let me know in the comments down below what works for you because I want to know. And if you find something that works in a hybrid incantation and sorcery side of things, let me know. I'll test it out, see if I like it, and maybe start rocking that myself. And if you don't want to use Ancient Death Ranker or Adula's Moonblade or Ronnie's Dark Moon or Glintstone Ice Crag, you do not have to. You can put back on your Comet Azur Cheese. You can put back on Meteor of Estelle. You can do Stars of Ruin. You can do whatever you want because remember, at the end of the day, guys, this is a template for you to go ahead and expand on and play the game how you want to play. Before we end our spell section, I did want to quickly mention that you can chain cast spells, which can be useful in a lot of situations, mainly for PvP, but you know, can be a little bit useful in PvP as well. As you can see here, rather than casting a spell, waiting, cycling to another spell, and then casting that one spell, I'm chaining these spells by casting them, switching, casting them, switching, casting them, and you can see how smoother the animation is. I did want to mention Karen Slicer here as well. If you go ahead and run with the Karen Slicer, or jump with the Karen Slicer, or crouch and then use the Karen Slicer, it'll make your animation just a tad bit faster. The more you know. And last but definitely not least, we have our Wondrous Physics Mix, and nothing has changed here. We're using the Cerulean Hidden Tier to eliminate all FP consumption for 10 seconds, and the Magic Shrouding Crack Tier, which lasts for 3 minutes and boosts our magic damage also by 20%. Now, one thing I do want to note with the Wonders Physics mix is don't be stingy and think it's only for like the Azura Comet cheese and whatnot. Keep in mind that 10 seconds of all FP consumption can apply to any of your other spells or incantations. And the fact that the Magic Shrouding Crack tier lasts for 3 minutes means you have an additional 20% boost in damage for your magic damage for 3 minutes. So whether it's boss fights or an area you're having trouble with, pop the damn potion, you're going to find another side of grace within three minutes. That's a Play-Doh guarantee. And that'll be the end of this guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you did stay to the end of this, you guys are amazing. And if I made any mistakes or if I wasn't clear enough, please let me know in the comment sections down below. As usual, if you want to give me a like, comment, and subscribe to this video, as well as hit that notification bell, I would highly appreciate it. As always, until the next one, peace.